Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Join our hosts as they discuss a wide range of topics and speak with leading cybersecurity, technology, and compliance experts. Now is the time for Secure Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we are joined by Matt Sosaman. Uh, Matt is a security architect and technology evangelist at Microsoft. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hey, good, Mark. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. How has your summer been? Uh, it's been very busy with a bunch of conferences and everything, but uh, getting ready for the fall. How about you? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, spent uh, three weeks with seven people, a dog in a small RV, and uh, I would not recommend that again to anybody. But um, I'm sure that yours was probably slightly more productive. Um, you went to a couple industry events, uh, including Inspire. That's, that's right? Yeah, we had a Microsoft Inspire, our big uh, worldwide partner conference back in July. What were, what were the major takeaways from that? Yeah, so for me personally, um, it was amazing seeing uh, the entire Microsoft partner ecosystem, you know, whether it's ISVs or IT consulting companies, seeing all of the really game-changing, I call, uh, cloud solutions that are out there and just watching what they're doing with things like artificial intelligence and even security, it was really cool to see and it's just a very great time to be in IT. Can you give um, any specific examples? Yeah, so we uh, we saw one um, one vendor. If you just walk the expo floor, uh, they were using um, a a Connect like device that when you walk by, it was watching the gate of your walk, and that's how it logged you into a computer. And so, just some really interesting solutions out there, um, just using different so, cloud technologies. So instead of like a facial recognition or some type of other biometric, it actually analyzes the gate of your walk and then and then yeah. you can match that up with you. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. Very cool. Um, I know that, um, you know, Hiram, the CEO of AdaQuest, he was at Inspire and he came back very, quote unquote, no pun intended, inspired and impressed. And uh, both in terms of the breadth of partners, the types of offerings that um, that the partners are developing to kind of uh, be part of the Microsoft ecosystem, uh, but also in terms of just the opportunities for partners to go out and you know deliver extra value with with Microsoft cloud products. And so, I mean, we're we're really ramping up right now with a couple new offerings as well. It just because it's like, wow, we got these great opportunities, and and now um, probably more yeah. than ever is is a, is a great time to be a Microsoft partner. Absolutely. So, what other events did you go to? Uh, so we had some local events down in Southern California. We actually did one with the FBI, and so we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. I got a good story from there, but uh, held some local security events, and then we have Ignite coming up here in September. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to that. Excellent. So, well, hey, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is um, MFA and, and conditional access. We um, at Adequest are getting a lot of requests to to support. MFA and conditional access deployments. Um, you know those those tools, those features are baked into um, Office 365, um, and they. But a lot of companies either aren't aware uh, or are not really skilled in terms of deploying it, and oftentimes they try to self-deploy and they run into some issues. Have you have you what what are you seeing around those those topics? Yeah, around MFA in general, um, we're seeing an upward trend, uh, most definitely. And, um, you know, it's it's getting really easy now with just the, the wide range of, of Microsoft solutions for MFA, but also just out there in the industry as a whole. Um, you know, it used to be when MFA first started getting popular, it was a text message based code or a one time pass code. Uh, but now we're seeing things like a push notification to an app and having it show up on your smartwatch or you receive a phone call or using things like Windows Hello to to log in and act as that second factor. And so it's getting really easy almost every day to the point where it's now becoming just second nature and kind of frictionless. Well, I think that's that's a, a big hurdle that many um whether it's real or just perceived that many, many organizations are looking at and they're saying, ah, you know, maybe, maybe this one type of authentication doesn't work, but now you all have, you know, authenticator app and these, those other methods that you mentioned. Um, when you say Microsoft, hello for, for listeners who aren't really up to speed in terms of what Microsoft hello is and how it works. Can you, uh, can you explain a little bit about that? 
Yeah, sure. At a high level, um, it's it's actually Windows Hello, and um, there's another version called Windows Hello for Business. But at a very high level, um, a lot of the PCs nowadays are shipping with uh, fingerprint readers and even a special what we call Windows Hello camera. And so what this allows you to do is sign into your computer every day with your face or a fingerprint. So if you take a look at just what I do as a Microsoft employee every day, um, I turn on my computer, I have a uh, Surface and built in as a Windows Hello camera. It does facial recognition and compares it with um, the face that is on file and it just logs me in seamlessly. And what's really nice about this is when you have all this configured and set up, it's then single sign on to all my apps. So I never actually have to type in a password. Uh, there's a couple legacy apps, of course, but I never have to type in a password to my most common apps. And so the last time I actually typed in my password is probably 60 days ago when I changed it. And so it just, it makes it really easy. Um, and then when you toss in things like conditional access, which we'll talk about later, um, you know, it just makes it really easy so that I, I don't have to be prompted for MFA every day. I just use my face to sign in and go about my business. That That's awesome. And so how would that work in an MFA scenario? Um, would you still have a second layer of authentication that would come after that? Or would, you, would it depend on where you were logging in from? Or I guess, obviously, if it's a different device, then you would, you know, the, the uh, Windows Hello wouldn't work unless you have it set up on that device. I'd kind of walk me through those scenarios. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So um, so just taking my my device here at Microsoft as an employee, um, it's a trusted device. And so uh, it's being managed by uh, Microsoft IT. And for lack of a better term, it's actually joined to Azure Active Directory. And so it's a trusted device. So um, when I configure Windows Hello, it's actually uh, two-factor by default. I have um, my face, which satisfies one factor. And then I also have a uh, certificate that's stored on a chip inside the computer. Uh, we'd call the trusted protection module. And so when I combine both of those things, that's two factor. Now, if I go and maybe log into your computer to check my email, uh, that's not a trusted device. And so the system's going to see that. And then it would prompt me for MFA when I go to log into my email, or I go to my personal home computer, or I go to an airport kiosk. And so um, that's how we can make this work really seamlessly in different types of situations by having a trusted computer or even a trusted network boundary. Uh, so if I'm in an office, um, I may not have to be prompted for MFA, but if I go outside the office, maybe to a hotel or to home, I get prompted for MFA. And that's kind of the beauty of this is you can be really granular and specific around how it prompts you, when it prompts you. And at the end of the day, it's all around user adoption and change management. So the easier we can make this for people to use, the better. 100% agree. And in, in fact, that's um, totally aligns with the feedback that we've been getting. A lot of organizations understand the importance of multi-factor authentication or con setting up some type of conditional access, especially for you know global admins, etc. What they also are concerned about, though, is user adoption and pushback, right? And if they say, "Well, hey, the, the people are just going to rebel; they're going to come and you know, uh, you know, throw throw firebombs at the IT department uh, because they're they're just frustrated that they're you know being forced uh, to do to do an MFA all the time." So, they're, so organizations they they want to implement, but they're looking for easier or more user friendly ways to do that. Um, can and one of the obstacles they also see is, is just setting up all the different, I guess, rules or policies related to MFA because you have to identify all these different use cases. Does that, does that make sense in terms of what you're seeing? Is, is, is it more just a kind of an organizational preparing to, and, and deploying? or Because the technology is there and ready, right? It's just kind of getting the right fit um, for each organization. Is that, is that similar to what you're seeing? Yeah, that, yeah absolutely. Um, you know... It, the technology is so easy the day, these days because it's in the cloud, right? It's just a checkbox. But the more difficult part about this is really what I call the business consulting side or, you know, really working to, with the organization and understanding, you know, what are your business challenges? What are your needs? Or in other words, what are your requirements? And then checking those right boxes in the cloud to make it work for you. And so a good example of that is what we just talked about. Um, if we want to make this really easy for users to adopt, then let's make sure that the technology is there and in place for trusted devices and a trusted network boundary as an example. And then we configure that policy so that you don't get prompted for MFA and you only get prompted when you're outside that boundary or on an untrusted device. And so um, the technology is certainly there. It's just a matter of knowing which of those check boxes to check. Um, and so that's really what we're seeing right now. And, and we're trying to encourage customers that don't just enable it, but 
let's take a look at your organization and your requirements and let's enable it and make it work for you the right way. Makes a lot of sense. Um, speaking of technology, I, there's a, a Microsoft partner company. I, I don't know how you describe it. I think Microsoft has invested in the company that um, provides a passwordless solution. And I'm talking about Trisona. Have you seen any adoptions of Trisona um, or are, are you familiar with the technology? Yeah, I'm familiar with the technology. Um, I've seen a couple of them out there. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just it's really exciting stuff. Um, there's some other vendors out there as well, like like YubiKey and uh, and some others, and some some that I actually met at Inspire. And this type of technology, where it's 100% passwordless, this is the future, and this is where you know I kind of see where things are going. And it's really exciting to watch. Um, I mean, if you just take a step back for a moment and and you think about not having to even know your password for as long as you're employed at that company, that's a game changing solution. Um, and when you think about the IT costs in the back end, you know, help desk calls to reset your password and that kind of thing, the ROI just starts going up. So it's really cool stuff. No, it's amazing. And I've seen different studies that say 30 to 40, 50% of help desk calls are for password resets, right? So if you can do a self-service password reset, that's great. But if you just can get rid of the darn password, that's even better. And I've, I've used, um, Persona, I at one time was managing maybe four or five uh, WordPress sites and, you know, just keeping up with all the passwords and trying to store them in a quote unquote secure manner. Right. And and it's like, oh, if I don't have that device or if I don't have the password for that locker and, ah, and just being able to do away with all that was so cool and so helpful. And I, I, I'm sure that we're going to get to a day and it's probably not too far down the road where the younger generation come up and we start talking about eight track tapes and, and, and other stuff. And they're like, what? And we start talking about passwords and they're like, what? <laughs> and uh, right. um, I, I don't think it's too far down the road. Yeah. You know, what's what's interesting about this when I when I think about MFA and I think about things like conditional access and just kind of the power of what we can do nowadays with the technology, I start to think about some of the business outcomes that can be unlocked from this. So if you think about a hospital environment, um, you know, you have a nurse's station, they may have shared workstations and having to log off and log on and, and all of those things can be quite cumbersome. And if you have this kind of passwordless solution, whether it's a USB drive or facial recognition or uh, something through your smartphone app and just being able to hot swap users, right? One nurse can walk up, do her business, and then the next nurse can walk up and you know, plug in her smart card or, or key and immediately have it just switch to her profile. That's game changing. And I, I think that really enables some interesting, you know, outcomes to the business when you start thinking about MFA and, and what that actually means for the organization. So it's kind of cool. Absolutely. And and then if you look over at the consumer side, I mean, one of the, um, the, the hardest things to do if you're in the uh, the B2C space is get that uh, initial customer interaction. And so, you know, that, that that cost of the initial acquisition or customer acquisition is much larger, uh, larger, excuse me, <laughs> than the um, than the follow up cost to get, you know, because once you get people in there ordering uh, to get the follow up orders is much easier. But but one of the issues is if they have to come back and log into their account and they can't find their password or they, you know, and they have to go through that process, well, then mm. you've, you've lost them, right? So once you've, um, you know, got done that initial uh, interaction, if somebody can just come back and they don't have to go through the whole password process uh, because they have some kind of passwordless uh, solution, that's a game changer as well because you just don't have to worry about, hey, they're, they're you know, they, they, they can't get back in. So... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting times, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes out of of uh, the big event uh, excite this this fall as well. I mean, do you, do you expect any big announcements in in relation to uh, you know MFA conditional access or uh, passwordless? Yeah, I'm excited to see what happens as well. Um, you, you know, when you know every year at these at these events, especially Inspire and Ignite, um, there's you know not only announcements of things, but there's also I, I kind of call it, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you go to one of these or you watch the, the sessions online. And um, I'm always learning new things that have been in the products. I just didn't know they existed. And so I'm really excited myself to go to these sessions and watch these videos and just learn about what else can I do with the technology that I didn't know was possible before. Um, you know, so it's, it's really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I'd like to share a quick story about MFA, actually, please, that, please. Yes. that came out. So, um, And I think the listeners here might really enjoy this. So a um, couple summers ago, I was working one of these conferences, and I was working the security booth, and I had a guy walk up to me. And um, to make a long story short, he was an, uh, he ran an IT consulting company, and he had a customer that owned, um, owned a couple retail stores and 
um, he started telling me about how this customer was embezzled uh, almost a million dollars and out of their company. And so I'm like, okay, tell me more. And so basically the story goes that um, the receptionist at one of these uh, locations of these retail stores uh, called up the, the partner, the IT's consulting company, just about every week for a year with some kind of an IT issue, right? Can't print, what, whatever it may be. And this guy came out on site. He would log into the computer. Well, doing this almost every week, she would be right next to him. And she actually looked over his shoulder and started memorizing the username and password to the point where she was able to guess it. And so she, to make a long story short here, she impersonated him, logged in, and the guy was a global admin in Office 365. And when she logged in, she was able to gain access to the owner's mailbox and then find sensitive financial uh, documents. Maybe it's a bank statement, whatever it may have been. And uh, she embezzled um, up to a million dollars out of this company over the next couple of years. And this company is very small. I mean, they had two or three retail stores, um, you know, maybe, maybe 30, 40 employees total. But it's really interesting when you take a step back and, and look at that story. Had MFA been enabled, it would have stopped that. And Ab it would have actually abs absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I mean right? I, I, I'm sure that story has been played out hundreds, if not thousands of absolutely. times. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. And what, what's really cool about this is um, about this story, and I think it's cool, is that um, they're actually able to catch her and they had to do a bunch of, uh, you know, closed circuit TV footage and a bunch of reconnaissance for that. But um, what's really cool about this is when they went back to implement MFA, they also took a look at just their IT security posture as a whole. And they started looking at, well, how many email phishing campaigns hit their email and, and all these other things. And now it wasn't just MFA, but they were able to add in some other solutions to better protect themselves. But it took one of these events to really trigger that, hey, let's do a security review and make sure that we're you know, up to stuff. And you're right. I mean, this, this plays out almost every small business you know, around the country and around the world, for that matter, every day. And uh, if you're in the business of making money, you have something that people want and they're going to figure it out. Absolutely. And it's not just small businesses. I mean, uh, I think it was last year, uh, one of the senior executives at Deloitte, uh, he hadn't, he turned off MFA, right? And um, uh, he lost his device and uh, so somebody was able to, to, to gain access to their platform. They, 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 they had a major breach and they all tracked it back to um, this, this specific executive turning off MFA. And it was somebody senior in the IT department. So it's like... You know, it's it's sometimes it's just the basics, uh, and but it can be like we we said earlier, people feel that it's a hassle. So if we can create an MFA or conditional access type of scenario, but make it as frictionless as possible, um, that's all the better. And that's what we're seeing with um, with a lot of Microsoft deployments right now is is just finding out what works for a specific individual or organization, and then using that method. So um, you mentioned uh, they they'd found out that in this particular case that they had been hit by some phishing campaigns. Uh, what are, what are you seeing in terms of you know tools and techniques to prevent or protect or respond to phishing campaigns? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, back in June, I went out and did an event uh, with the FBI here in Southern California, and. Um, it was really interesting. I learned a few things uh, from the FBI at that event, and one of them was the the, the biggest ind industry that actually is the, the top target of email phishing and um, and really uh, just targets of attack is something I didn't really expect to hear was real estate. And when you think about real estate, I mean, it makes complete sense because you have realtors that are basically independent contractors, and they're using different cloud services and maybe even personal email, and so. When you think about you know how this applies to just anybody from small business to enterprise, um, it was quite shocking to hear that about real estate. But when you start peeling back the onion on all this, on all this, when people get fished and you have these uh, advanced attacks that are taking place, we're starting to see a downward trend of email attachments, right? And these attachments traditionally contained macros and some malicious code in it. Well, vendors out there, including Microsoft, have really advanced their techniques and sandboxing email attachments and doing the detonation chamber and you know stripping those malicious attachments out of email. And so now these attackers are tr starting to uh, transform and rather than having exploited attachments like a PDF or Word document, 
they're now starting to rely on phishing-based attacks with a link in the email. And so when you click on that link, oftentimes these attackers will impersonate something like Office 365. So when you click on that link, it'll ask you to type in your Office 365 credentials. And in the web address bar, it has you know a website that looks pretty similar to Microsoft. The background image, the logo, everything kind of looks like my company but it's not my company. And when I click on that link and I type my credentials, they're now stolen. And so that presents a huge problem. So how do you fix this? How do you, you know, really help to add some barriers in there? And, and of course, multi-factor authentication is a big part of that. Um, Cause even if I do type in that username and password, they're not able to be used without MFA. But um, we're starting to see some solutions out there around email phishing. And so you take something like Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection, that allows you to uh, basically rewrite these URLs that are in an email. And so if, you know, if I'm a, an average employee and I just click, or a realtor in this case, and I click on the email link, um, it's actually going to go out to a Microsoft data center first. Uh, we're going to scan that link and do some other things in the background. And if it is malicious, then we're going to put up a splash page and say this, this website is, uh, contains a threat and we're not going to allow you to go to it. And so being able to just prevent you and stop you in your tracks is, is really powerful. And, and there's some other vendors out there doing some similar things. But um, that's what we're seeing right now is, is email phishing is still on the rise. It's still the number one threat vector. And every business from a large company down to a, a small mom and pop shop, um, they could be targets there. And so, you know, I like to say the human firewall is the best firewall, of course, with education, but we also need to have that defense in depth approach and have the right technology in place. Well, yeah, and, and, and Microsoft brings the whole security graph to the table. And I, I don't think that there's any company or organization in the world that has that much data, real time accessible that you can just say, hey, you know, has this URL been involved in any malicious yeah. activity? I mean, how? I don't. I just don't think there's another organization out there that can that can match that, and so that's super, super impressive and powerful. Um, that's the that's ahead. the power of of the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph, is what we call it. And you know, if you take a look at these phishing websites, um, you know, through Bing, we scan 18 billion websites every month, and so we know what the bad ones and the good ones look like. And being able to have that information, that telemetry on a catalog that these products can tie into and ask whenever you click on that link. That's really powerful to get that real-time detection. It's huge. And again, me as a, as a, a user or as a, a, a company owner or any type of executive, it, it brings a certain le uh, level of se a sense of security, right? I mean, I, I know that if I click on, uh, on on something I shouldn't have been clicking on, um, I, at least I'll have that backup protection there, right? And so, it's, you know, because a lot of times you're not exactly sure and should I click or not, but it gives you a little extra sense of security there. Um, you mentioned real estate agents or real estate companies as being um, one of the main targets for phishing campaigns. It's interesting because a few months back here in, in the Seattle area, we had a, a title agency and one of their employees had been uh, basically they had identified or they would send a list of people who were getting ready to do a transaction and they they were sending this list which ultimately turned out to be an organization somewhere in eastern europe so then they would send uh, a spoofed url that looked exactly like the escrow company's site and they would send with that information uh, or with that email uh, information about how to deposit the um, the down payment for the transaction, and this uh, ended up. What happened was is that a couple lost five hundred thousand wow. dollars. Now they were able to pull pull back about four hundred twenty five thousand or something like that of that, and they were able to kind of you know shut this down in this particular title agency. But you got to realize that's just one title agency, and you know how many of these transactions go on, and 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 you know, and it's just a spoofed URL. So it'd be really nice if I got an email. And, and, and right away when I opened it, I got an alert saying, hey, you know what, this email is associated with some bad activity, you better beware. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Microsoft graph and everything. I mean, that's really kind of where the power of all this comes out. And, um, you know, if, if this is happening, happening to uh, families when they go to purchase a home, um, it's going to happen to every business. 
And so, you know, I, I meet a lot of customers at, at industry conferences and I, I talk to a lot of people and, you know, people usually fall into one of two camps when it comes to this topic. It's either, you know, yeah, I, I'm aware of it and we're, we're doing what we can to you know, protect ourselves. And the other side is, I don't think it's going to happen to me, so I'm not really going to worry about it. And, um, you know, today's day and age, um, this is just the world we live in. I mean, this is happening every day. And so it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you, it's a matter of when. And honestly, it's probably happening to you right now, and you may not know it. Um, you know, we we have a, a crazy statistic that we that we have, but, you know, the average attacker sits inside, whether it's your personal email or your organization's network, on an average of over 100 days. And so that's like me sitting on your couch in your living room, um, you know, drinking beverages out of your fridge, listening to all your private conversations with your family, and you would never even know that I'm there. And so they're waiting for the right time to strike, whether it's a, a uh, an email coming through about escrow or it's a uh, an accounts payable transaction. They're waiting for that perfect time to strike so that they can you know get that money or be able to ele elevate their privilege and do what they need to do there. So this stuff is real and. Um, yeah, I think it's something that we all need to just pay attention to as uh, as citizens in this modern world. It's a pretty spooky picture, but it's I totally believe that it's accurate. And I think if anything, the takeaway should, should, from that should be that um, we should all be on our guard. Right. And that's that's the bad news. The good news, though, is technology is really caught up and, and really it's the power of the cloud. I mean, if you look five to 10 years ago, some of this capability that exists today just did not exist back then. And if you talk about a, a large enterprise or even any business, you know, we used to have our data center and it was like a moat in a castle, right? We had our large castle walls and, the, and the, the moat around it. Well, that moat has dried up and the castle walls have been broken down. And, you know, nowadays employees are storing their data on, you know, any cloud service. They're bringing their own devices, including laptops and smartphones. And so really the, the new firewall is not these expensive hardware devices anymore. It's really identity. And you know, we're now in the business of protecting your identity and protecting your data, no matter where it lives and travels. And that's a really big paradigm shift, but the technology is really caught up. So you talk about things like MFA, that's definitely part of the identity protection portion. Um, and then we talked about conditional access, which uh, layers into that, but things around protecting the data itself. So, you know, if I do need to email my, my real estate agent about, about escrow and that kind of thing, um, there are solutions out there now that allows me to encrypt that data that's in the email. And so, you know, the good news is the technology is caught up. Uh, kind of the bad news, it's the threat's still very real, but you know, we're, we're getting there, right? We're, we're trying to make this as, as easy as possible for people to adopt, but um, change is hard, of course, but uh, I, I think we're rolling our way as a, as a society. Um, and if you just look at your personal, you know, you know, business, whether it's email or just logging into Skype here to use, right? Just doing something as simple as MFA there can actually help protect you or on your bank account. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, good, good stuff. Absolutely. And um, I think, you know, you said uh, as a society, things are getting better. But I think uh, a big part of that is, is the work that Microsoft's doing. Because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times it's just comes down to human act behavior, right? And human awareness. And people make mistakes. People get tired. They get sloppy. They get in a rush. What Microsoft is doing with a lot of your tools is just making it frictionless to use. You know, a lot of the DLP, you know, where you go through and, it, you, you, you know, you force encrypt or you, 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 you send the person an alert and say, hey, you may want to encrypt or, we, you know, you can't share this document outside the organization. So it's just creating kind of automating that. And that's a, that's a big step forward because, at the you know, we can't all become security, security experts, right? right. But... But if you can make it easy for me to just do get on with my life and you know not have to jump over too many hurdles to do so in a safe manner, boom. And I think that's that's the the, the path that uh, that Microsoft is on right now, and it's super impressive. Yeah, and you know what's really cool about this is um, you, again I talk about the you know the power of the cloud as, as cliche as that may sound, but it's, it's quite real. And when you start thinking about artificial intelligence, uh, some of the, the the crazy things that we can do now is um, let's say a, a, an employee at a company actually clicks on that email link and they actually do leak their credentials because nothing's 100% secure, right? Something might at some point get through the barrier. Um, but let's say they, they do leak their credentials and those credentials are stolen. Um, by default, there's some Microsoft technology built into these products that it will actually go out to the dark web and it will look to see if those stolen credentials have been found out in the public domain up for sale. Because a lot of times these attackers, they're just middlemen, right? They're going to take your username and password and they're going to sell it to a third party for, for high amounts. 
Well, we have technology that will just go out there and, and scan that and then give you the, the visibility that, you know, hey, look, these credentials are up for sale. Um, and then we'll give you the, the option of, you know, blocking that user from logging in and whatnot. And in often cases, that can all be automated. And so that's what's really interesting about all of this is the automation and the, and the AI behind it to make, you know, every time you log into whether your laptop or, you know, QuickBooks or just some kind of line of business app, um, we know what's happening with that identity behind the scenes and we can block you or maybe even just limit your access. So we'll allow you to log into the app, but maybe not download something, right? Or maybe, um, you know, read only, whatever it may be. And that's what's really cool about all this. So the, the technology is definitely there. Um, and that's possible thing, through things like conditional access and, uh, and Microsoft 365. But um, you know, we, we still have to be you know, on our toes and understand the technology. That's, uh, that's super impressive that, uh, <laughs> that you can go out and search the dark web automatically in an automated way and just say, and send automated alerts saying, hey, you know what, your credentials are for sale. Um, that's definitely going to raise, raise some flags in any organization, but that's, that's cool that you can do that. Hey, um, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, Matt. Uh, any, any parting thoughts or anything that uh, you'd like to share about what's come, you know, uh, coming up in the next couple months for you or Microsoft? Yeah, yeah. There's there's two things I want to share. Um, you know, because this is secure talk, and we're we're talking about security. Um, there is one thing I want to share uh, for the listeners out there. Uh, there's a report every year that Microsoft publishes called the uh, Security Intelligence Report, and this report's about 20 pages or so. Um, I promise it's not a, a white paper, but it's more it's more interesting around what is Microsoft seeing out there in the security landscape. And so we just have five topics on what we see, and there are things like botnets and you know social engineering and ransomware and that kind of thing. But this report's really interesting because through all of our telemetry, through all of our cloud products and services, we're able to see what these top threats are, and then we share it back out there with the public. And so if you have a moment, you know, download this report and, and take a look. Uh, you just do a, a search out there for Microsoft Security Intelligence Report. Um, so the second thing I want to mention is, um, so I'll be doing a couple events here uh, later this fall. Uh, of course, one of them is the Microsoft Ignite Conference. If you have the means of going, highly recommend it. Um, if you can't join us, it's always available online to watch. And you know, there's there's hundreds and hundreds of these sessions that you can watch and download. And whether you're an IT pro or you're a, a business executive, um, there's usually a session that will that will pique your interest around the technology. Um, so definitely check those out. And uh, I'm looking forward to joining you on the next podcast here, Mark. And thanks again for having me. This no, is great. No, that Matt, it's 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 been a pleasure as as usual. Um, and I'm definitely going to go and download the Microsoft Security Intelligence Report. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to uh, to view some of the Ignite sessions as well. Um, you also have a, a blog, right? I do. Um, so you can find me at, uh, at aka.ms slash Matt's blog, M-A-T-T-S-B-L-O-G. And uh, that's where I blog about all things uh, Microsoft and security related. So uh, please do check me out there. I highly recommend it. I get a lot of useful information from your blog and really appreciate you putting that together. Well, hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, like I said, I really appreciate you coming on, this, on the show and uh, look forward to crossing paths with you hopefully someday soon. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Cheers. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Join our hosts as they discuss a wide range of topics and speak with leading cybersecurity, technology, and compliance experts. Now is the time for Secure Talk.